so um, just I have been talked to thanks our sponsor for this event so this is done and, uh, and I thank them very warmly and um, I'm Lea Dissiocio I'm the head of the St sustainability program at CLAT and uh, I will chair this uh, workshop session uh, morning and afternoon um, and I'm very glad to have you here to discuss this uh, very important topic. And um, just two, two slides to post a few slides to post the scene. So, um, um, Stephen, in a publication in uh, 2015, um, put uh, um, an understanding of uh, socio-economic trends that was uh, increasing so he explained that uh, in uh, 1850 was the first industrial revolution and uh, we have a beginning of the increase of these uh, socio-economic trends and uh, an, an explosion, exponential explosion of them in uh, 1950. So uh, these trends were population, of course, but uh, energy, primary energy use, water use and so on. And these tra this trends had a great impact on the earth system trends. This means that we have an increase of uh, carbon diox dioxide production, uh, nitrate oxide, ocean acidification, and so on. And this is the problem anyway. So if we speak about microelectronics more practically, just one of these trends is water. Water is very important. What's, what's happened in uh, 2021 in Taiwan? There was a severe drought and uh, they had to reduce the water consumption in every science park by 15% mainly. And here you have the image of a tank in Baoshan, in Taiwan, normally and during the drought. So this was a real problem and with the reduction was not enough. So they decide to reduce water for um, the crops and to give this water by trucks to the industries. This is one of the big problems we have to solve. And in Europe, if we look to the digital market, the digital market, we are producing semiconductors for the digital market. The digital market represents only 5.5% of the European economic market. But looking to the planetary boundaries, we are producing 40% of the impact on climate change, See, around 40% also on the material used. And if you look to the theoretic digital boundaries should have been, it's the dot point in the middle. So this is what we have to solve in Europe. And uh, just to give you some facts and figures, um, digital in Europe represent around 571 million of tons. This is the weight of 9 billion of humans. We are producing 1,066 million tons of waste this is the weight of around 2 billion of humans. And we are using energy on the use phase only, around 300 terawatt per hour, and this is 10% of the energy used in Europe. These are also issues we have to solve. So we are here to discuss this today with what industries, RTO, and academic people thinks and acts on these subjects. Um, sustainability development will help to reduce these issues. And what does it mean? Remember, in 1972, Meadows, with the uh, limit to growth, already alert to this problem. Nothing was done. So we are today, and there is the the climate is uh, hotter and hotter, you have seen this week in Grenoble. And what's going on tomorrow uh, with the population, with the food, we will have maybe problems. There is not a day that something will happen. 
the sky will fall over your head. No, it will be gradual, but everything will be hotter, more difficult, and so on. And uh, sustainable development will tend to reduce these issues. So that's why it's very important to work on that topic. So it's time for everyone to walk the talk and to accelerate. So uh, these workshops is about these issues and this problem. It was constructed like a life cycle of a product. We are using raw materials. So Patrice Chrisman will talk about critical materials and resources. We are doing fabrication. So we'll have Jean-René Le Quepes, uh, RTO, exp will explain our program. Pascal Roquet from ST Microelectronic will talk what they are doing on the fabrication of semiconductors. And Christophe Bissery from Safran will explain what they are doing in eco design in a system producer. For use, Marc Duranton uh, will uh, discuss about, about the use phase of uh, the um, uh, numeric, the digital technologies. And with the end of life, we we'll have two persons, uh, Christian Thomas from TND, that will speak about the Can Sanukura project, and Guillaume Guillot from MTB Group, will speak about inno in innovative um, technologies to recycling. And to discuss together with all the panelists and with you, we will have two panel sessions. The first one, I will have the honor to, to chair it, about how to accelerate from heredity to industry. The second one will be led by Stéphane Bourg from CEVA ISEC and will be about service economy. They will explain everything to you about that. And we will be joined by Aline Pierre from Région Aura Entreprise. So, I think that's all for me. And let's uh, warmly, uh, I will introduce Mr. Patrice Christmas. So let's uh, acknowledge this. Uh, thank you to be here and well. <laughs> so take uh, anyone. Okay, purple one. And this for the slide. And you have 25 minutes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, a warm thanks to Sevaleti for having invited me to contribute to this uh, meeting, uh, to this workshop on sustainability. So, um, hmm? ah, okay. No way to get a bit a larger image on the screen? No? It's my slide. Bad luck. Uh, <laughs> so, I was uh, asked to introduce the concept of critical and strategic minerals and markets for the ICT and talk a little bit about related sustainability issues. And I would add a subtitle by my own that this world is hopefully going to be driven by two fundamental things for end users, including industry, depending on a supply chain, it's the obligation to inform your end users and for end users, it's the right to know. If that doesn't develop and develop fast, then this world is maybe going to doom. Here, the minerals and metals industry is a very complex industry. There is not a single minerals and metals industry. There is an industry or even several industries, say for silicium, because silicium has many end users, or for copper or for phosphate and so on. All these are different industries and by the way, it mostly happens that a company specialized in lithium won't be doing any lead or any copper. These are different technologies, different know-hows, and so on. But what that industry has in common is it has many, many stakeholders. I'm not going to detail that. You can read that at your leisure. But what matters here, what the message is here, is that ideally, those stakeholders should all contribute to make it happen. There won't be or there is no minerals and metals production if there is no investment, if there is no agreement for laborers to work in a given factory or mine or whatever. Uh, uh, trade unions have a big role, media, governments, and so on and so forth. So now the question is, 
is there going to be confrontation between the stakeholders? And you and me, all of us in the room, we are stakeholders. We buy every day products and services made from minerals and metals. There's an old saying stating that if you can't grow it, you have to mine it. So it means uh, our lives would be sheer misery without food, of course, and without minerals and metals. So, and you are to the right of that slide. Now, confrontational collaboration, and that's going to be a big issue for the forthcoming years. It doesn't look very good. So, strategic, I was asked to try to clarify a bit what is, what are strategic minerals, what are critical uh, minerals and metals. Now, the bad news is there is no harmonized definition of those terms. And that is not the only case where in the minerals and metals industry there are no universally recognized semantics. Uh, for those who are familiar with that industry, for instance, the use of resources and reserves is a total confusion. So, um, so therefore, I give you my two cents of definition, which is used by a few other people, but again, not universally recognized. Strategic is something that you really need. Strategic, a strategic mineral or a strategic metal is something you need for your process, for instance. Uh, in your industry, I'm not an ICT person, I'm an end user of your wonderful products and services, but uh, to you, for instance, gallium or germanium or silicium are strategic inputs, absolutely. Now, critical means that those strategic inputs you need to develop your products and your services may be impacted by two key factors. One are supply risks. So a mild version of supply risk is price, rapid price escalations. That's not yet a break of supply, but it's a tension. So, and that happens more or less continuously in a, on the minerals and metals markets, prices increase and decrease, sometimes at a very fast pace, depending on multiple factors. The other factor is your vulnerability to the supply risks. In some cases, it's pretty easy with a minimum effort to substitute raw material A by raw material B. But in some cases, it's totally impossible. Or sometimes it's possible, but you need to invest a few billions of dollars to solve the problem, which is, again, really problematic. So many factors may impact on those um, supply risks and uh, on uh, your vulnerability. I'm not going to detail further. I'm just going to show you the latest version of the EU raw material, critical raw materials matrix. And there are many, many publications since more or less 10 years. The topic of minerals criticality has become very popular. And the literature is just growing exponentially, which is good for the cellulose market. Um, so here, um, but all those uh, analyses are more or less on the same basis, supply risk versus vulnerability. So here in red, you have the latest version of uh, the EU um, critical uh, minerals assessment. It's from 2020. And our friend Stefan Bourg, who is present here, is coordinating a project that will deliver very soon, um, hopefully, uh, <laughs> uh, the a new version of this. Now, the interesting story is here. This is the third edition of uh, the EU critical raw materials assessment. The list is just getting longer and longer from one to the next edition, meaning that so far, EU policies have been reasonably inefficient to address those criticality issues. Because one thing of importance is in Europe, seen from a European perspective, we produce less and less of what we use. Europe is the only region in the world, compared with Latin America, Asia, and so on, where the minerals and metals production has declined significantly by 33% over the last 20 years. Because the point is we are wealthy, most of us, not all, unfortunately, and we certainly don't want a bloody mine in our garden, hey, wow, not. 
you know, NIMBY syndrome or banana, build absolutely nothing near anything else. Um, so we are all there, including myself, I have to be honest. Uh, now, if it comes from some dirty, messy mine somewhere in the so-called Democratic Republic of Congo or China, why should I care? What matters to me is I get it delivered, uh, I get the product and the services I need. But that's not going to work forever, beware. Now, here, uh, you are, your industry is one at the bottom here. This is a supply chain, a simplified uh, depiction of a supply chain. It all starts with geology. Geology is the series of mechanisms, natural mechanisms, that have uh, made it possible for a given mineral to concentrate. There is copper, a little bit of copper everywhere in the Earth's crust, but of course in insignificant quantities. It's not economically recoverable. So you need some geological processes to concentrate it and make it economically recoverable. And it's geology that dictates where deposits are located and where you may or not open, hopefully, a profitable mine. So you need exploration, you need the development of your project, and you need investment into the actual mine. You need to process the ore. You need some sort of metallurgical and, in many cases, refining process to get pure copper or pure silver or pure silicone. Sometimes you need an extra stage of purification, which is a business by itself. Uh, for instance, silicon, you are not going to use in your microchips uh, the sand from the Sahara as it is. <laughs> that would not absolutely not meet the kind of purity uh, criteria you need. You need ultra pure, I don't know, 7N, 8N? What's the purity of silicon you need for wafers? 8N, something, yeah, you see. So there are companies specialized in this ultra purification to re remove these uh, uh, remaining impurities. Then you have manufacturing components and so on. And at the end, you may have a computer, you may have a space shuttle, you may have your car, your fridge, and so on and so forth. So now, in classical economy, in the linear economy, we are used to, if you are at the end, why bother about all these details? Wow. Uh, no. All you needed to know if you are an end user is what's the price of copper today, give a ring to your uh, trader and uh, you have the copper price in the newspaper, multiply that price by the number of tons you require and get it delivered to your warehouse within a few days. That is not going to work very well and very soon. We have it with Ukraine already. Think two minutes that China takes over Taiwan. China is the key, the world's largest producer of 40 minerals and metals critical, very critical to the world economy, including to its very own economy. So, in the EU, uh, the factors used in the analysis so far is to look at country level production. So, where is the raw metal uh, being mined? What is the geographic concentration there? Uh, what is uh, the uh, country level uh, concentration of uh, metallurgical processes um, and uh, what is the uh, country level governance at each stage. Um, so, a few key figures about the minerals and metals industry and how it impacts globally. So, these are very uh, broad uh, picture but it will hopefully convince you that the mining industry is not without huge sustainability issues. One, the production of minerals and metals is 16% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. So it's an absolute major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. And that is particularly, not all minerals and metals are equal, we produce every year 250 tons of beryllium. Who cares about the CO2 emissions from beryllium? Also, probably the per ton emission of CO2 for the production of beryllium, the beryllium metallurgy is quite complex, it's probably high, but 250 tons, who cares? So the three main contributors are steel, aluminium, and cement. These are more or less 95% of the sources of greenhouse gases. So the reduction of their greenhouse gas emissions is absolutely major. Then worse, even worse, to my taste, is a recent paper in Nature last year 
has shown that for the first time, provided a pretty detailed assessment of the waste generated by the mining industry, and especially what's called tailings. These are the it's a very fine grained material like uh, mud uh, from the processing of the ore. You need to crush and grind the ore uh, before you can go do metallurgy. And uh, you separate the ore grains, the, the valuable minerals from all the rest that is not valuable, and that rest is named tailings. 13 billion tons of them are produced every year. That's five times the global household urban waste uh, flow. Five times. Now, of course, part of that waste is silica. Uh, or quite uh, most of it is uh, silica. But in many cases, it's tainted by uh, minerals that are not recovered because they are not economic, like arsenic minerals. Mercury minerals, cadmium, selenium, tellurium, all these are absolutely great and wonderful if they leach into nature and from there go to taint your food or your drinking water. You'll really love it. So, open pit mining is, a con is a getting a more and more contentious issue in high biodiversity areas. For instance, nickel. Nickel, the green metal, it's green because some of the Minerals of nickel minerals are beautifully green, like the garnierite in New Caledonia. But uh, it's uh, green also because it plays a very important role uh, for the future of electromobility. It's one of the key components for the cathodes of lithium batteries, and it's getting even more and more important by the time. But some argue that it is far from being green in the environmental sense, because some of those, uh, not all, but some of those nickel mines are large open pit mines in Indonesia and the Philippines and in other tropical rainforest areas which have, which have extremely high biodiversity. Now, for geological reasons, you cannot do otherwise than strip, clear-cut the forest that is over the deposit to access the mineralized layer, which is a surface layer. So I won't go into the details, but nickel has uh, quite a number of nickel mines have a very high impact on negative impact on biodiversity. Mining activities can also be very water intensive and very energy intensive. I mentioned that already. And all those sustainability issues can be highly disruptive for a world where despite the promises and achievements of the circular economy, the demand for primary minerals and metals, primary means produced from a mine compared to secondary uh, produced by recycling, which is going to be discussed by Christian Thomas and maybe some other speakers later on. So the demand for primary metals, whatever we do on the circularity and whatever we need to do, is going to grow exponentially in the coming years. And the paradox here is particularly, not only, but particularly, due to electromobility and the energy transition. Because you need much more metal, sorry, to do a windmill, a megawatt or a terawatt with a windmill or a photovoltaic panel than uh, with a, a nuclear power plant or even a bloody uh, coal-fired power plant. So that's the bad news. So the uh, energy transition is going to be highly uh, minerals and metals demanding. And there's, for instance, there's number of reports, but one which is quite good and uh, well documented by the International Energy Agency from last year, 2021, which tells the whole story and it's pretty well made. Now, the problem is that in many jurisdictions in the world, there's a growing opposition by local populations to whatever act mining activities there may be. And here I just uh, pasted together images about stop mining, mining kills you, and so on and so forth. And, and this is not just uh, because uh, I would have exaggerated green feelings, but Ernst & Young, uh, EY, uh, publishes every year a survey. It's, you can download it for free. You have the reference there for the latest edition. Ernst & Young every year publishes a report on the main business risks to the minerals and metals industry. And in the 2020 one edition, number one business risk out of 10 is environmental, social, and governance issues. 
uh, in the techno speak of the minerals and metals industry, uh, we uh, say uh, that uh, this is um, the, the social license, the environmental and social license to operate, which is not a written license, but that is the agreement, that is the consensus among the stakeholders I mentioned uh, earlier on. For instance, in France, France is a very rich country in terms of mineral potential. We still have plenty of minerals and metals. But last week at, in Nancy, we had the World Metals Forum, I was there. I was dis discussing with Robert Friedman, a well-known billionaire. He made billions in the minerals and metals industry. He's a well-known figure of that global industry. And I told him, he, he was asking me, Patrice, uh, what about France? I told him, hey, Robert, because <laughs> we call us by our first name. I told him, Robert, if you want to waste your money, just come to France. You will learn to run for your life. Uh, because the people will maybe shoot at you. So uh, it's, it's almost impossible to do anything about our own mineral potential. Why that potential could help us to provide sustainably, sustainable solutions to our own needs. Try to do the same for oil and gas in France. Eh? <laughs> Good luck. Here, um, this is a, a copy-paste from uh, various uh, headlines from a website which is not any kind of dark green uh, intellectual terrorist side. No, 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 it is not from the Republican Party in the US. No, uh, it is mining.com. That is an industry news, a no very normal, uh, plain industry news uh, website uh, about the minerals and metals industry. And you see uh, some very minor things like, for instance, up left here in Chile, here, Atacama lithium mining steers fight over flamingos. Pink flamingos may block the energy transition, and especially electro uh, electromobility. 25% of the world lithium comes from a salt lake in Chile called the Salar de Atacama. Now, around the place where they extract the brine to produce lithium chemicals you need for the batteries, there are three different species, endemic species of pink flamingos thriving on some freshwater ponds. Nobody is exactly sure if there's any connection that is not scientifically demonstrated uh, between this lithium uh, brine abstraction, because that is salt brine, which is unsuitable for human users, and the freshwater the flamingos are thriving on. But it's a very contentious issue. And when things become contentious, it's very difficult to put rationality back once things have started. And when you look at those slides at your leisure, you will see many more and threatening. Tantalum, tantalum, your industry wouldn't exist without tantalum because those are those microcapacitors you need on your motherboards for many, many applications. And that tantalum, sorry to say, is produced according very yek standards in the so-called Democratic Republic Congo. And the initiative to develop the traceability of tantalum is itself very, very uh, dis uh, critical. Uh, you, may, you can criticize it because uh, <laughs> uh, it's very hard to monitor conditions in areas where human life is exactly worth zero. Now, how to evaluate supply risk? So, technology shifts also need close monitoring. Technologies are changing very rapidly, and what is critical today may not be critical tomorrow. Demand side, on the demand side substitution, rare problematic resources may be replaced by abundant and less impacting resources, and that is the way the products of tomorrow uh, can be done. Can biomimicry, for instance, can biomimicry replace the use of some minerals and metals? Because we have plenty of bioresources around us. Uh, for another example, wheel industry, now there's a lot of talk on the, about the criticality of graphite, natural graphite. We need it for lithium batteries, but will it still be needed in 10 to 15 years? Some very bright minds at CEA, for instance, one of the CEA spin-offs, uh, Nawa Technologies, is developing a new way to store energy based on uh, nanotube, carbon nanotubes, and there are other technologies developing. So the whole battery technology landscape may look very different in 10 to 15 years than it is nowadays. And of course, that needs 
close monitoring. Not every ton of a given mineral and metal is born equally from a full sustainability perspective. There is lithium, for instance, that is produced in environmentally quite benign uh, conditions and some others which are very high impacting. So, but a few questions that investors should and uh, industry also need to ask themselves. Can the minerals and metals I use be traced to a given producer? Are you exposed to reputational damage? It may come, and it already came, times where customers or NGOs will blame your company for supporting child labor or warlords or whatever in some corner of the earth, and you don't know. But be prepared for the consequences. Um, how does this producer perform? What do you know about its performance from a sustainability perspective? What about its water use and water management? What about its energy uh, management? And what type of energy does he use for to produce his minerals and metals? What are his emissions? Uh, solid, liquid, gaseous. Uh, is that mine? Is there a mine closer strategy? What will happen to that mine and to all the waste it may have generated once it closes? Who will be responsible uh, for all that waste? What about biodiversity impacts? What about social issues? including on conflicts with populations impacted by those activities. What do you know about your supplier? You will be asked for it. Be prepared. It started, and it will get stronger and stronger, and it's very good so. Uh, it's for finished uh, uh, the period where any industry could use any mineral without asking itself any question and without informing its customers. That is changing, and it needs to change. Or again, we are facing doom. Important drivers for the development of sustainability in minerals and metals production, so innovation-driven production, uh, cost reduction focused on energy and water use and emission reduction can be win-win situations. When you reduce your emissions, uh, when you use your energy intensity, you save money, you cut your costs, and at the same time, you reduce your, uh, you improve your sustainability impact. So I mentioned the right to know and the obligation to inform. Um, so the future investment in minerals and metals needed for the energy transition will be hundreds of billions of dollars. And a big question is who is going to invest? Because it's already very difficult to secure investment in new mines. Uh, investors prefer to play any kind of options on the stock markets than investing into a mine, which is a much more risky and complex story. So uh, one key ingredient for sustainability is not any technology uh, stuff, it's trust. This world is in severe need of trust among all of us, because that's the only way we can advance. And trust needs to be based on verifiable information, on transparency, accountability, and so on. And that is uh, the key ingredient we need. No investment will happen if there is no trust by investors, for instance. Here, uh, that is just, uh, I won't de detail it, it's just an overview of uh, what uh, the demand will be for some of those raw materials which are of importance to you. And uh, for those with the red bars, that is essentially tantalum. Uh, this is, uh, I don't see where this production uh, can come from. It's a totally mysterious question. The same uh, to some extent for uh, gallium is not as critical. Indium, the demand is going to increase, but uh, that is not going to be as dramatic. But tantalum looks uh, particularly um, uh, pro uh, problematic. So the ICT industry is obviously a so complex social, technological, and material global realm. It's uh, not a single kind of industry. Uh, requiring much more minerals and metals than those stated on the previous slide, and uh, Lea has shown very nicely in introduction what this is going to be. Uh, there is one word here uh, that uh, drives me nuts, that is dematerialization. Some people say that dematerialization is uh, going uh, to lead the world. There is no such thing like a dematerialized society. ICT is a very material industry. Okay. Um, yeah, we need research and innovation, a lot of it, and it's still uh, heavily underfunded. 
And uh, here, uh, just a few uh, um, reports you may be interested to. Uh, the UN, uh, International Resource Panel I was a member of, has produced a comprehensive report on minerals and metals resources governance in the 21st century. Um, and uh, on, in France, uh, there is an official uh, web portal on minerals and metals. You have it here. And uh, this is just information. And then thank you for your uh, very kind invitation. I'm looking forward for uh, the discussions. You have here the references mentioned in my slides. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Christmas, for this really interesting speech. So, well, uh, welcome the next speaker. That is Marc Duranton. He's a member of the Digital Systems and Integrated Circuits Division. And he will uh, talk to us about uh, energy consumption. Yes. So first, thank you for the invitation. Uh, so a few words. Uh, I am from the uh, sister organization of LETI, which is LIST, where we are more involved into architecture, software, and applications. So first, let's say what my presentation will not be about. It will not be about the R strategy for the circular economy. It will neither be about the use of elements in the manufacturing of IC that was well, well presented before, and we see that it's increased over time. But my presentation will roughly be about uh, the Jevons paradox, which is basically saying that when you improve something, let's say by a factor two, well, the demand increased by more than a factor two. So this is a psychological effect, and uh, this is perhaps the primary thing that we need to focus uh, uh, in the future. But okay, I will not deal uh, uh, on, on this topic too much. So my presentation will be mainly about the increasing energy consumption of ICT on trying to give you some idea on how to cope with it. But first, I would like to uh, give you this slide, which I think is, is very interesting because it's a prediction of energy consumption of ICT over time. So uh, uh, when you see the prediction that were made by the same organization in uh, 2015, then their prediction of 2017, uh, 2019, and 2020, and what we are basically here. So, uh, basically, the point that here is that predictions are not always correct because most of the people didn't take into account all the parameters that are needed to make a good prediction. And in this particular case, they didn't take into account the performance improvement of computing system. And, uh, well, I am an architect. And I work in architecture for more than uh, 30 years. And energy consumption was always our primary goal uh, for the system. So, but uh, going back to the Jevons paradox, the demand is ever increasing. So this, I, I really like this kind of drawing because it shows you over time the evolution of what is happening in one minute on the internet. So I think the 2022 will be available in July generally. But you see that instead of having low demanding exchange like text, which is slowly decreasing, more and more demanding data are exchanged, like video. So you see that now Netflix is more than 50% of the internet bandwidth. And uh, going back to the need, do we really need to have 4K video on a smartphone? I'm not sure, but okay. Uh, uh, we also have increasing demand of picture on higher resolution picture here. And, and also more voice. So here is the selling of the new devices, so the smart speaker and um, things like that. So uh, uh, this is perhaps not too demanding uh, in terms of energy. We will see how. But perhaps it's a renewal with a new market. So it's moving from uh, one kind of device to a new kind of device. So of course, you need materials uh, to build these new devices. So uh, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a trend. Uh, what we are seeing, and we didn't see it uh, a decreasing in the future. So uh, in television, we are always uh, starting thinking about 4K video and, uh, and things like that. 
Uh, well, I'm more involved in artificial intelligence, and we all uh, see uh, all this uh, uh, increasing demand for computing power. So computing power is roughly translated into energy, uh, it's a uh, it's thing, but it's uh, increasingly uh, and exponentially growing uh, for the top end model. And with a growth of, uh, uh, it's doubling every three and a half months. So remember, more slow, doubling every, well, 18 to two years a month. And uh, we could see that uh, the best model of two years ago for the learning uh, required basically uh, uh, more than 20 days of an exaflop computing. So just last month, we have the first exaflop machine. And uh, it's, uh, it's in terms of megawatt of energy that are needed for this system. And uh, so this is the picture that comes from the MIT that so that learning, well, not this very top-end model, but uh, uh, lower-end models, uh, have the a carbon footprint of uh, four, of five, roughly five US cars from their complete lifetime of the car, including fuel. So here you could demand, okay, this is, uh, this is really uh, 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 a big problem here. But also, we need to see what's happened in the past. So I take here the supercomputing of three years ago. So uh, I, need, I think I will need to change my slide next year because I want to have a rough picture with uh, 200 petaflops. So next year, I think that we have the first machine we, which will be two exaflop, so uh, 10 times better. Uh, so when we compare to an old computer of uh, 33 years ago, so the Cray-1, so we see that in uh, 33 years, we have an increase of performance of 100 million. So if we translate it into cars, so in 85, the fastest car was a Lamborghini, 300 kilometers per hour. If we translate by 100 million, we should have now the Star Trek Enterprise running at 25 times as a light of speed. Well, of course, physically it might not be possible, but uh, physicists might, might invent new, uh, new things. But if we go back to the energy, so the Cray 2 was 200 kilowatts. So summit was about uh, 10 megawatts. So it's an uh, increase of 50. But if we make the ratio, so that means that the energy efficiency increased by 2 million in 33 years. Not a lot of in, uh, uh, industry could say the same. So now, if the automotive industry could say the same or the plane, yeah, that we might not have so much problem about uh, energy crisis and things like that. So just to say that this is a big concern. Uh, but the community is aware of, of it, and of course, we still need to improve and, um, and uh, how to improve it, and that will be the, the part of my, uh, the end of my presentation. So the key point is that you need to see the complete scope, not focus only one topic. So you need to have the right application, so selecting the right application, the right algorithm to make this application, the right programming language, the right software stack, the right way to code your information, of course, the right architecture on the right technology. And clearly, we need to have this global optimization all around this, um, uh, this uh, spectrum. So it's why certain companies, so now vertical companies, are able to make this global optimization. And uh, we all know that uh, some of local optimization has lower effic efficiency than a global optimization. So that means that we need a global co-design from application, algorithms, software, data coding, architecture, and technology for this. And I guess that this is also uh, very important for the other aspect, like, uh, like the material, like the use of the system uh, uh, that were uh, explained before. So, uh, just to give you an, um, um, an idea about the order of magnitude. So, from the application, of course, here, uh, the, appli the application are driven by the consumer. So, we need to be aware of the Jevons par uh, paradox, but uh, here we cannot, I was not really able to give you figure. But so the selection of the algorithm, if you select the wrong algorithm for the same function, you could have up to five order of magnitude less energy efficiency. If you uh, choose the wrong programming language, 
similar, uh, uh, more than two order of magnitude. Software stack also could give you two order of magnitude. Architecture, well, if you use the wrong architecture, is, is even worse. So you could have a six or seven order of magnitude in terms of loss of the, of the system. And of course, all of this rely on a technology with more slow, uh, that should be the best um, um, a possible energy uh, uh, technology in terms of energy. So I will try to give you some more concrete case in all this aspect. So in terms of algorithm, so uh, uh, one of the point is, is that not algorithm are symmetrical in the sense that when you have solution, it's often more difficult to get what are the origin that gives the solution. So if you multiply two prime number, it's quite easy, it's a multiplication. But if you have the result trying to find what are the two prime number, it's very complex calculation and it's one of the basis of the, of the cryptography. So it's here, here where new technology like artificial intelligence, quantum computing can be used because they could be some, uh, some oracle, some uh, crystal ball that could say, okay, uh, I think that these are the two uh, elements that make this. And after you only have to verify that this is the right solution. So this, instead of making the complete exploration, you could use oracle that could uh, globally lead to less computation to make the operation. One more example, which is uh, 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 well known, if you want to make a Fourier transform, so either use, uh, you use the basic algorithm, so the DFT, which is basically growing with the square of the number of elements. But you could also use more optimized alg algorithm like the uh, uh, FFT, so the, um, the fast Fourier transform uh, using the Kuhle-Tokay algorithm, which is growing in n log n. If you use uh, this for one million elements, so the difference is 50,000. So even for uh, one key element, it's already uh, uh, more than a factor 100 in terms of computation. So choosing your right algorithm for doing something is very important. Well, uh, uh, I could also illustrate this with artificial intelligence. So I show you the rising uh, uh, demand for the top model, but this is another curve. So sorry, it's not very uh, visible, but uh, it shows that for the same functionality, so the, the compute demand is decreasing by a factor two every 16 months for the same algorithm using neural networks. So because of the improve, in improvement of algorithm of um, uh, uh, in uh, in deep learning and uh, uh, I show you about GPT-3, which was uh, 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 disclosed in 2020. Just last month, uh, Meta show an equivalent network which has a similar performance, which only take one seventh of the footprint of uh, GPT-3 uh, in the um, in the system. And uh, so you see that it's very important also to think at the, at the algorithm level. At the software level also here, uh, uh, of course, this could be criticized, but I try to uh, show you the extreme here. If I found two very simple functions, one written in Python and one in C, if I compile them, so uh, without optimization of the C of, of the C code, you are uh, so the C code is running uh, 45 times faster. So in terms of energy, so this could be also roughly uh, uh, compared to this. And if you use optimization then it's now going to five order of magnitudes. Well, in practice, it's more 2025. Well, this might not be a problem because people that are programming in Python, so the Python is more the orchestrator of libraries that are done in optimized code. So that is uh, also made some, um, uh, some uh, bemol in what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking here. So with all this consideration and uh, to show you what we are doing at CEA in this field, so we develop in the term of neural network a complete uh, uh, environment that allow to optimize all this part. So uh, starting from the optimization, 
uh, so you could see that this is quite similar to what uh, uh, Google or Facebook are doing, except that from this we already uh, use optimization using uh, target architecture uh, optimization. So like memory requirement, compl uh, computational complexity. So that's allow early in the development to tune the architecture of the neural network to be more efficient. And the next step after is to use quantization. So basically, trying to reduce the number of bits where we code information. So I will go it later uh, in my presentation. And after, indeed, being able to make an optimized code generation, so using the right programming approach to be very efficient in the hardware. Just about um, a quantization, so uh, uh, this is what the tool is doing. Uh, so it's quite obvious that if you can do the same application using information in 4 bit instead of uh, 32 uh, bits, so you gain, you gain eight, eight times more efficiency. So that's, uh, that's the thing, and even more if you are using uh, a 32 bit floating point. So this is also very important to uh, not blindly use a double precision floating point, but to be more efficient here. So that lead also to new architecture, like neuromorphic. So the idea here is to use the sparsity of the data representation. So instead of computing every time you have a new data, so you compute only when you have a change in the data. So basically, you compute only on the derivative of the signal. So that also allow you to code information if in very few bits, so if you code the derivative, you could say, well, it's increasing or decreasing, so it's only one bit, so that could be very efficient. So that could lead to, to new coding scheme, like the spike uh, that people are thinking for this kind of architecture. And even more, better, we can use physical phenomenon to make computations. So the basic operation of neural networks is making a weighted sum. So you could use the more slow to make the multiplication, so uh, and the um, a Kirchhoff law, so the sum of a current in a node or the sum of a charge on a capacitor to make this. So that's allow uh, to use physical phenomenon to make the computation you need instead of, of explicitly using a lot of uh, uh, a digital circuit to make all these kind of things. So here it's what we call analog. Uh, in term because it's an analogy between the physical phenomenon and the operation that you want to do. And this could be done by electrons, by photons, by anything else. So this allow uh, to make very efficient system. So you see, so all the big players are in this field. So you see IBM, Intel are, are developing architecture using this. And this is uh, one result of the project where we were involved uh, with, the unit with the University of Zurich that you so show uh, you that uh, this allow very low uh, uh, energy system. And one other point which is important in terms of architecture is that the more you specialize, the better you are energy efficient. So this is a quite old slide uh, from NVIDIA, but that shows you that basically the same operation done on CPU and a GPU is 10 times more efficient on a GPU. And if you are using fixed function, you could even gain one order of magnitude. So having the right architecture for your problem, so tuning it is also a key to have a high energy efficiency of the system. And here, again, we could use artificial intelligence to make this exploration of the possibility to find the right architecture. So here we could get a 16 uh, a performance increase. So that was the work that we had done uh, 10 years ago in, uh, in NXP. And uh, here you could see the trade-off. Of course, I need energy to build the artificial intelligence, but this, if this artificial intelligence allows to design systems that are uh, 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 sold in million or billion pieces that are 10, 20 times more energy efficient, so the global uh, energy uh, uh, approach is positive. So that's, uh, that's why we, we should take into account is the global view, not only a partial view of the problem. 
So one of the key elements here is that uh, communication of data is also uh, very expensive. So making a, f uh, a double precision operation took about uh, yeah, a few a few hundreds of a uh, few tens of picojoule, but getting data to this is again uh, nearly three order of magnitude. So we need to avoid to move data. So moving data to the cloud, so if your application is making an average of one gigabyte of uh, sensor data, I think it's better to make the average locally than sending one gigabyte of data to a server uh, in the other side of the Atlantic. So again, uh, avoid to move data. So that's need that leads to new architecture, so like uh, computing in memory, so it's also some kind of work that we are uh, working on it. And uh, if we want to process data locally, we need to be very efficient in the processing. So here, if we have an intelligent uh, retina, so process sensor on processor, what you do today is that typically, uh, 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 if you want to double the resolution, you double the frequency. But now using the right technology, and it's how I'm going back to the low part, oops, sorry, so uh, the right frequency allow to have uh, uh, same performance, so same working frequency, but a lower voltage. So if you go from dot four volt to the classical 1.3 volt, you gain again a one order of magnitude. So it's what you could do, and to do it uh, uh, in terms of architecture is, well, you multiply the number of processing units here. So, of course, you have more processing units, but each one could work at a lower frequency, so then globally you could gain uh, uh, your global energy. You could even go further and having a, a, a processor just below the matrix area. So it's where here 3D stacking that are developed uh, uh, with Leti are very interesting for this new architecture that are very fast and very energy efficient. So this is one chip that we develop, which is uh, a typically 10 times more energy efficient uh, with 100 uh, times more processing power. And I would like to uh, finish with one of one of examples that we did with uh, with one of our partner, uh, Dolphin uh, Dolphin Design, on uh, efficient neural network architecture. So we try really to use this global co-design approach to design this architecture. So uh, uh, really having the right applications, the right uh, approach, the right programming language using N2D2, uh, the right software stack, the right uh, data coding, the right architecture, and of course the right technology, uh, um, uh, FDSOI. So that summed up to, um, uh, to a system which is uh, uh, quite scalable that supports uh, that is supported by the software stack that could do all these quantifications choosing the right algorithm. And basically, we end up uh, with the system that in the common benchmark, the ML common benchmark, uh, end up to be uh, uh, basically uh, uh, three times better than the competition in the uh, keyword spotting. So you know it's detecting uh, Alexa or Hey Google or Hey Letty, uh, if you want to do it. Or the visual wake word, we are even better. And uh, this was recognized just this week because uh, uh, this architecture win on awards in the embedded world uh, 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 conference uh, just this week. So uh, just to, uh, to conclude, in the computing architecture, we went from the monocore architecture where everything was fine, we didn't have concern about energy. Uh, when the technology was not so nice, we went to many core architectures, so now we are going to heterogeneity, so specialization to be more efficient. We are moving in an array where uh, data uh, on, on, on logic and computing are nearby, and perhaps in the future we could go to new computing paradigm that could be also energy efficient for this kind of oracle function like quantum computing or optical computing. So that's basically uh, what I wanted to say. And uh, at least in terms of architecture, and due to this green context, uh, I think that we live today a very ex uh, exciting time. And I like to finish with the quote of Alan Kay, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So it's up to you to do the right thing so that we, we could have a, a, a brilliant green future. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mark, for this brilliant talk uh, that presents how engineers work hard to reduce energy use. So let's uh, tell, leave the floor to Christophe Bissery. Christophe Bissery is the responsible of the SA substance regulation at Safran, and uh, he is the um, material processes environment project team manager at Safran Electronics, and he will explain us how he introduced eco design in Saffron teams. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so um, I will present you how we've we have introduced uh, eco design recently in our RET activities, mainly focus on uh, uh, um, substance uh, substance orientation. So um, first, I will start by a, a short presentation of Saffron. Uh, so we are uh, the third uh, world player in the aeronautic uh, sector uh, with a long history, more than one century. Uh, we are now back on track after the COVID uh, crisis with a 15 uh, billion euro turnover uh, last year. And uh, we are uh, a little bit more than uh, 76,000 people. Well, this figure is moving quite uh, uh, quickly as we have uh, launched uh, a quite proactive uh, hiring plan, more than 10,000 people for the coming year. So I, I leave the message in this room. If there is any interest uh, in uh, ASD sector, I will be happy to, to answer to your questions. Uh, so we are active in the following business, where we are well known for our aircraft propulsion business. So the delivering of aircraft and helicopter engines. Also, uh, we deliver uh, um, equipment for aircraft, such as uh, landing systems, uh, also uh, uh, cabins and systems, uh, and an activity uh, through uh, Ariane Group, which is a GV between uh, uh, Safran and Airbus, uh, in space activities, so launch, uh, space launch vehicles, uh, satellites uh, propulsion and space uh, optics. Uh, a focus on, on defense uh, quickly. Uh, as it is managed by the Safran Electronics and Defense. Uh, so we, uh, we develop and deliver navigation and uh, guidance systems, uh, optronics uh, equipment, drones and robots, uh, equipment for uh, war fighters and also uh, uh, stuff for missiles propulsion or guidance. So our main uh, strategic uh, objective is now uh, oriented uh, uh, towards environmental excellence uh, through uh, uh, an active contribution to uh, a safer and more sustainable uh, aviation uh, through um, uh, the reaching of a target, so it's shared with the sector. Uh, the target is, is to reach by uh, 2050 uh, net zero carbon emission for aviation which is a very uh, challenging uh, target. And for the, uh, the Safran uh, uh, participation, I would say, we uh, contribute through uh, innova innovative technological uh, solutions, mainly for with the uh, three tracks. First is new uh, design of uh, uh, engines, uh, lightweight equipment. Uh, the second is the use of sustainable fuel. And, and finally, the shift to uh, hybridation of aircraft or electrical uh, Propulsion. Uh, let's uh, see now uh, how uh, our context has changed, mainly through um, uh, regulation evolution. And the major actor of this evolution is the European Commission, which has launched in uh, 2021 uh, what they call the uh, uh, Green Deal uh, uh, Initiative. You may have heard about it. And um, under this uh, initiative, uh, there is a particular objective to reach a toxic-free uh, environment. And connected to this uh, initiative, the EU Commission has launched the revisions of the two main uh, existing regulations, uh, which have an impact on substances, uh, REACH and uh, uh, ROS. You may have heard about these two uh, regulations. And uh, this, um, this revision uh, aims to uh, um, reach a simplification and uh, potentially an extension of the scope with a timetable of uh, uh, approximately uh, 2024 for REACH and 2023 for ROS. And they have launched also uh, more recently a new regulation uh, which uh, name is SKIP. You have may heard about uh, uh, 
uh, it also skip is the acronym of substance of concern in products and uh, the aim of skip is to improve the traceability of substance in uh, in products to ease their end of life recycling and and to ease also the reintroduction of the secondary secondary materials in the new manufacturing so and the end the goal of these new regulations is to improve the circularity of the European industry. Uh, European Commission has also launched the revision of the Eco-Design Directive uh, to extend uh, its scope uh, from uh, energy-related products to a, a larger group of products. Uh, we, it's, it's a project, but we speak about textile, furniture, or uh, intermediate uh, products with uh, high environmental impact and the, the objective is to make it more efficient to improve uh, uh, product uh, sustainability. So they have uh, introduced uh, uh, new criteria or the, the plan to introduce new criteria. You, ha you have hit on the right hand side uh, of the slide and you can see that these criteria are dealing with, uh, with life cycle, consumption of energy, consumption of resources, recycling, either end-of-life recycling or uh, recycling content, carbon footprint, life cycle, uh, uh, environmental footprint, that all these criteria are re related with the product life cycle. And you see uh, trends in the uh, regulation evolution is the progressive introduction of these criteria into the future regulation. Uh, on the customer side, we have also some evolution. So I've picked up here the experience for my sector, uh, uh, aerospace and defense sector. Um, but I think it is representative of many sectors now. Uh, so there also the public uh, authorities are playing a, a major role. Uh, so in France, it is the, the French MOD, Minister of Defense, uh, and the DGA, so the Direction Générale de l'Armement. Uh, which have introduced uh, two years ago uh, new criteria related with uh, eco-design uh, and environment evaluation in their specification for new development, new projects. And you are here also on the left and on the right hand side of the of the slide examples of uh, of the criteria that now industries have to fulfill and to answer to participate to this um, to these projects. So you see there you have criteria dealing with uh, environmental profile of material. You have um, criteria related all there also um, dealing with uh, recycling, either end of life recycling or recycling content. Um, list of materials which have to be uh, reduced, uh, the use should be reduced. And there we speak about critical materials that we have uh, 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 seen uh, earlier in the in the presentations, so all these uh, all these criteria are, are gathered in eco design grid that have to be fulfilled by the by the industrials uh, who are um, uh, participating to the project. So you see progressively uh, on the customer side also an evolution, uh, a move from the regulation compliance which was focused only on, on uh, substances, now uh, an evolution towards uh, the, the consideration of life cycle uh, criteria. So um, now a word about uh, eco-design and how we have uh, introduced it uh, in the Safran activities. So first, I would like to come back just on the definition. Uh, I've picked up the definition uh, um, of eco-design, which is, uh, um, let's say, used by the European Eco-Design Directive. Uh, so uh, the, the directive um, defines eco-design as the integration of environmental aspects into product design with the aim of improving the environmental performance of the product throughout its whole life cycle. So I pick up here the, um, the, main, um, the main concept of life cycle. So the first is life cycle thinking uh, to cover the environmental impacts from the raw material extraction up to the end of life, which may be recycling or dismantling uh, energy valorization. These are examples. 
The second concept is the multi-criteria environmental assessment um, to avoid uh, the potential transfer of pollution uh, between stages of the life cycle or between the type of impacts that may occur on the environment. Uh, the third point is the, we speak about eco-design, so it has to be introduced in the design activity as early as possible and not as a separate process, but really embedded in the, in the design activities. And finally, the objective is, to, is the improvement of the environmental performance, either by uh, reducing the impact, and this is what we think uh, uh, naturally, but also by improving the, the, perf the performance or the quality of the uh, delivered service. So we can play on the two tracks, uh, reducing the, uh, the, the impacts, but also uh, improve the quality of the delivered service. So let's see now how we have introduced this concept in the design activities of Safran Electronics and Defense. Uh, first, uh, a word on the TRL, uh, TRL method. So Safran RIT projects uh, are following the TRL uh, maturation uh, approach uh, by using so the TRL uh, scale, TRL for acronym for technology uh, readiness uh, level. So the objective of this approach uh, is to reduce risk uh, within the RIT uh, projects. So you're probably uh, probably familiar with this uh, with this approach. I will not enter in details. Uh, just to say that uh, in the within Safran, we have decided that uh, the, the level to be reached um, for the RIT projects uh, before uh, being released to uh, and make available to the design teams was the TRL6 level, where we think that the maturation is enough to have uh, a risk which is limited. So you have here, uh, you have here the, the, the design uh, process uh, that we are uh, following. So on the top of the slide, you have the, the maturation process that I've just uh, mentioned. And um, from TRL1 to TRL6. And one, uh, once the TRL6 is reached, then, then the new material, the new technology or new process could be released and make available for the design teams. So we have introduced um, um, eco-design objectives within this system. So first with general uh, objectives. Um, so the, the, the first objective uh, is really to progressively assess the environmental characteristic of the materials and process along the maturation uh, progress from TRL1 to TRL6. And the second objective is guide the design, the design choices in order that at each choices, we take into account the environmental characteristic, environmental impacts, to guide the choice in order to reduce these, uh, these environmental impacts. And uh, uh, at the end of the maturation uh, pro uh, process, the idea is to uh, reach the most complete knowledge of the environmental characteristic of the new developed material or process. So at each uh, TRL level, we have introduced specific, um, specific objectives to be fulfilled and which are reviewed uh, to at each step and each time to switch uh, from a TRL1 or to TRL2 to TRL2 to TRL3. Um, at each review, these uh, objectives are reviewed and checked, and uh, it's mandatory to uh, progress in the maturation uh, process. So I will not go in details of all these, uh, all these uh, objectives. Uh, I've summarized the co-design activities mainly in four activities. So first is data collection. Uh, initially, uh, more generic uh, data, and progressively, as long as we uh, uh, progress in the level of maturity, uh, they become more specific. Uh, these data are used to make assessment, and this assessment uh, helps to identify what we call the hotspots, environmental hotspots, uh, where we have really the issues, where are the real the environmental impacts. And uh, with this assessment also, we can identify the uh, improvement tracks, improvement axes, and then test, select, and choose the, the, the most relevant one. And at the end, uh, the questions um, 
um, is to uh, perform life cycle analysis. So it depends from a project to another. Uh, it's mainly related with the final objective of communication. If there is a requirement of communications uh, regarding the environmental characteristic, uh, the environmental performance of the new materials or new projects, then the recommendation is to go through a life cycle analysis to, to, to get really uh, uh, the data to support the communication. And if the, communi if the communication is external, then it is mandatory. And finally, so it's end up with the specification of the new of the new uh, material or process. Uh, to so to to support the development within Safran and Safran Electronics and Defense, so we have uh, we have developed a lot of internal tools, uh, uh, guidance, uh, checklist, uh, templates to support the data collection, data assessments, the review between the TRL levels. Uh, uh, that I just uh, uh, presented. And uh, our goal, so we, we have started not so long ago, right? that was uh, two years ago, 2020, and the objective is now to have 100% uh, of the uh, innovation project which implement these uh, this, uh, eco-design methodologies and um, uh, produce uh, new environmental data. So I will uh, now present some examples to, to show you how we, uh, we've, uh, we have implemented these tools in some projects. Uh, the first project is uh, related with the selection of uh, a low temperature brazing alloy uh, in the context of, uh, of substitutions to uh, lead-free uh, solutions. So there was uh, four uh, pre-selected alloys using uh, alloying elements uh, uh, that you have on the screen, tin, copper, indium, uh, bismuth, uh, uh, silver. Uh, the functional unit was, um, was a cubic centimeter of solder applied on a printed uh, circuit board. And uh, we have chosen an environmental reference that was the existing solutions, uh, so the traditional lead-containing lead alloy. Uh, this uh, environmental reference is uh, really important uh, as it is really the reference which we which is used to make comparison and to to check uh, if the, the the new development uh, brings really an improvement in terms of uh, of environmental uh, uh, performance uh, as we do not have in many of the situation a target we do not know uh, at the beginning what is the relevant target for environmental performance so really the idea is to make it by comparison and the study has been implemented on the, you have here the system boundaries, so from the raw material extraction up to the production step. So you have here the results uh, which have been obtained for the TRL3 uh, uh, review. Uh, so the, at this step, the calculation was made with um, uh, generic data uh, coming from uh, literature and also environmental database. And as you can see on the graph, um, the assessment reveals that uh, uh, all the solders are not uh, equivalent regarding environmental characteristic. In particular, the gray, the, the gray one um, reveals a, a, a better performance on all the uh, impact criteria compared to the reference, which is the, the, blue, uh, the blue one, and compared also to the, uh, to the other alloys. And, uh, the, the, um, the study uh, allowed also to identify what were the sources of the, of the impacts. And there we, we, we saw that the, the, the main uh, environmental impacts was related with the, the application phase, energy consumption during the application phase, and also the silver uh, content of the alloys, so the impact related with the silver. Um, so we, we mm, the, the projects uh, made some sort of recommendations for the next steps of the maturation process. So that was mainly to collect more data, to precise uh, data is a key uh, is a key issue for environmental assessments. So there also, so a need of data mainly focus on the application phase because this is at this phase that there was the the, the most uh, uh, in environmental impacts. 
uh, and also uh, some recommendations uh, regarding a, a certain kind of sobriety in the use of materials on uh, energy and uh, on energy efficiency. And I take this opportunity to share, uh, um, let's say, a, a learning from from this uh, um, from this project. Is that in most of the case, um, we uh, the, the the environmental improvement goes together with cost efficiency and cost reduction, because with uh, energy efficiency, with uh, material efficiency, th you create environmental improvement, but also cost reduction. So that's. That's the good news for us, is environmental uh, performance is uh, very often linked with uh, economical performance. Uh, a, second, um, a second example um, related with substitution of materials. Uh, it's not in the, in the electronic applications, but I think that could be uh, transferred also. Um, so the, the project, um, was to uh, for a navigation system made with aluminium to switch to uh, an alternative material, a lighter metal, um, to reduce the weight of the system. So the, the environmental reference uh, chosen uh, has been the existing components made with uh, with aluminium, and uh, for this uh, for this uh, project, all the lifetime um, the, the life cycle has been uh, included in the in the study. So from uh, material extraction up to the end of life. Uh, so here are the results that have been uh, obtained for the TRL5 review. So you have here on the graph in blue the um, environmental performance of the reference and in gray the, um, the alternative, uh, the, the, the solutions made with the alternative material. And then you can see on the on, on, on the several uh, environmental criteria that that none of the, um, the solutions uh, behave really better uh, depending on the criteria that was the reference or the alternative solutions. But what, what we have discovered for during this, uh, this calculation and the, during this study is the huge importance of the logistic and um, mainly due to um, um, transportation steps done by air freight and uh, you have here in orange in the in the graph the um, the environmental the environmental impact of the alternative solution without this uh, logistical step and you can see that that's a great impact on the uh, environmental impact of the solution so that's that's a typical findings of this kind of study eco design study you identify environmental hotspots and the 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 goal and the mandatory uh, uh, goal of the, the design team is to solve and improve the performance related with these environmental hotspots. Uh, as the project uh, was dealing with the uh, reduction of weight, we have extended the results, uh, the, the study to the use phase. And you have here the results um, of the, um, the, the, the environmental impact, including the, the use phase. So you, you have the difference there on the graph between the aluminum reference and the environmental impact calculated with the alternative solution, the alternative material. And you can see that the reduction of weight has a great, uh, a huge impact on the environmental performance uh, of the solutions. And uh, that's on the graph for uh, climate change criteria, but the results were the same for all the, the environmental criteria. So for, um, let's say, this kind of results really justify the priority that we put on weight reduction as a first, really, a strategy for environmental improvement for all uh, activities, aircraft, uh, let's say, aircraft activities. But uh, further improvements are also possible for materials and components and in particular we anticipate the effect of the decarbonization of the um, of aviation I, I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation that we are really involved in the decarbonization of aviation the result of decarbonization is a 
progressive reduction of the impact of the use phase. And we will reach the, the moment where we will, not, we will not have any longer this kind of graph and that the, the weight of the environmental performance of the materials will be the major source of the impact in the life cycle. So that's why we anticipate these evolutions by working also on the environmental improvement of the, uh, uh, the, the, the environmental profile of the material that we use and we include in our, pro in our products. So I will conclude. So what we have ahead of us, we, you have understood that we have now implemented the eco-design approaches in our first step of uh, uh, development, so the maturation process of materials and processes. So what we are working now uh, is on the extension of the use of the eco-design methodologies to the whole uh, development process, including the uh, uh, product environmental, uh, the product development, sorry, um, and uh, including also the engineering, mechanical or uh, electronic engineering. So it brings, it will bring new challenge uh, for us. And um, our main challenge will be uh, really uh, the, to manage the complexity which will be related with this extension. You have here uh, some figures just to illustrate the complexity we have to deal. Uh, so we, we have about 30,000 internal articles which are developed um, and manufactured within uh, electronics and defense. For, the, for these articles, we use more than 100,000 articles that we purchase on the market. Many of them are, uh, are electronic components. So all these, uh, all these uh, uh, components and articles require a huge amount of data to collect and to maintain. So this is one of the, our main challenge. And the second challenge will be to uh, develop tools adapted to process all these data, so mass, uh, uh, mass of data to be processed, and to make it at a reasonable cost, and also usable for non-experts, non-eco-design experts, because our MNP experts are not eco-design experts. So we have also to, to propose and to deliver some tools which are adapted to the people that we have. So that are the challenge that we have ahead of us. And um, that concludes my presentation. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Christophe, for this very nice speech. So I will ask the panelists to come and have a seat. So Patrice, Christian, Marc, have a seat and a microphone. And uh, okay, the title of this present this panel session is from R and D to industry: How ca we can efficiently manage change to rapidly take into account the problems of global warming and resource depletion. So this question I will ask you at the very end of the panel session. But before, let's go through some details. So we had lots of answer in your presentation, but. Uh, first of all, first things, uh, maybe I will leave one minute to Christian to introduce himself because you didn't speak this morning. I think it is open. So, yes. Uh, okay, my name is Christian Thomas. Um, I am working, I, I'm, I'm, I developed a company which is uh, called TND, uh, Terra Nova Development, which is an R&D uh, company specialized in extracting um, metals from waste. Uh, waste can be uh, uh, printed circuit board, batteries, uh, lithium batteries, and so on, and go to the purity of metals required by the market. Uh, we have a project which is called Sanukura in uh, the Ardennes, which will uh, uh, process 20,000 tons per year of this material and extract a number of metals. I will explain that later on in, this, in the afternoon. Thank you. So, uh, first question. Do you think that regulation is the most effective lever to accelerate? What type of regulations will be needed? And at what level should this regulation be done? Countries, Europe, others? Maybe Christophe, you were the one speaking uh, of regulation. You can begin the answer. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you have seen in my presentation that uh, regulation has really a, a very strong impact on, on the markets and on the, um, the companies. And according to, I, uh, to, to my experience, uh, regulation is really important to accelerate. Uh, in probably in two ways. The first is that uh, if, you, if you want to accelerate in um, the environmental improvement, you have to, um, let's say, introduce these criteria in the uh, product evaluation. Uh, and um, uh, regulation is really a way to accelerate the, um, uh, the, the embedding of these uh, criteria in the, in, in the product evaluation. And I mentioned in my, in my presentation the, the example of the eco-design directive uh, revision, which is in preparation. And uh, it is really the target, is to introduce uh, new environmental criteria in the product evaluation. And then it will really uh, uh, push uh, the, the, the other activities related with the ev evaluation. Uh, data, co data generation, data collection. Um, it will also uh, help to develop uh, methodologies, evaluation methodologies, um, a common methodologies among the, uh, the several uh, uh, fields of activities. Because we mentioned that uh, the supply chain is complex, is it, it is international. Uh, when uh, you have a components uh, manufacturing, it can go in a lot of different products, in a lot of different uh, final uh, applications. So you need to uh, find a common way of assessment in order that the data which will be generated would be useful. So regulation is, a, is a, according to me, a, a key level to accelerate. Anyone wants to add some things? Any one of you? Yeah. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, thank you. Um, well, just a, a point. We, for a company like uh, Sanukura, we need a permit, an IPPC license. Uh, it took us uh, two years and a half to get it. Uh, just to say that acceleration is not really at the moment achieved. Uh, I would say also that it's important that there is a synchronization between all the worldwide uh, regulation because, yes, it could be nice in one part of the world, but if we ignore it uh, on, on some of the part, it will not fly. Uh, second point, uh, unfortunately, I think that regulation always come late when the problems are, al uh, are already there. And we need also to think about how we could practically apply them. I, I took the example of the GDPR. Very nice idea, but uh, this forces n us now to click uh, more than, uh, than before on even giving rights to, uh, that we didn't really want. So, so uh, how to implement and how to practically implement this regulation, this is also very important. Okay, yes? I'd like to add a word, uh, yeah. Regulations are necessary, they are very important. Not everything can be done on a voluntary basis by industry. Of course, we need a level play field at the global level. It's not only the EU or the US and so on. Um, we need to integrate the four dimensions of sustainable development. There are four, not three. Social, environment, economic, and governance. So it's a vast subject. But regulations by themselves are not eno enough. We need people to implement them. And those regulations can be of utmost complexity, and we need very qualified, honest, reasonably paid people to implement them. Because without the proper implementation, without the proper evaluation, that regulation is just going to be useless. So, and <laughs> that is a huge uh, thing to do. I heard a lot of about LCA, for instance, but uh, uh, to me, uh, there are um, huge issues with current LCA. Uh, basis and we would need, for instance, a global LCA system shared, uh, regularly updated, which we don't have. Thank you. So, second question. Is money an obstacle? Uh, if yes, how to unlock this? And how we should pay? So, please, Mark, maybe? 
Yeah, it's interested. funny that you asked to a uh, researcher guide to talk about. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> That's why funny. I begin by you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, I think it's, um, uh, of course, it could have two faces. So first for company, it could be an opportunity to go into this field and could improve their market share because indeed it's uh, it, it could be really uh, making new products that are more greener, more sustainable. And we see some companies that are already uh, uh, surfing on this uh, green wave. Uh, it should be real also in the company and not a, a green washing. So uh, just an example, uh, uh, in all keynotes of Apple, they have this uh, uh, this panel about uh, uh, energy and things like that. So this could be opportunity for company and I think that's that should be the drive for them to move because unfortunately money is what drives them most of the time. Uh, on the other side, uh, if this lead to increase of, uh, of cost of products, that might be also a bottleneck for the consumer to, to buy the new product. So we need to know what are the acceptable costs uh, uh, that, uh, that are here. Uh, perhaps this could be different uh, from country to country and things like that. And we see now with the increase of, of prices of vegetable and things like that, uh, and things like that uh, less people are using the, the bio uh, a kind of product because they are uh, um, more expensive. So, uh, uh, so it could be an opportunity. So money is here indeed, uh, but uh, it should be uh, rightly used. Anyone wants to con comment? Yeah. Well, ju just uh, what I mentioned also in my presentation that is, uh, um, we we see um, environmental uh, performance related with extra cost, but um, this is also a source of uh, savings, and um, I think it's Im really important to to also to switch our mindset. Um, we 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 think that. Uh, uh, environmental performance is uh, linked with extra costs. That's not always the case. So that's that's also opportunities for companies to uh, restore margins, and not necessary with uh, extra uh, prices on the markets. That's uh, so. That's uh, money. Uh, sure, uh, that's also an opportunity. Yeah, money is absolutely no problem. Just on the derivative financial products, trillions of open positions are existing. So. Uh, there is a lot of money floating around in the world. Um, at the UN International Resource Panel, which is walks the same level than the IPCC, which you all know, uh, we came up with a recommendation that uh, to have a 0.1% tax on the minerals and metals production globally. That uh, is about worth a trillion dollars per year on non-fuel minerals and metals. 0.1% would be uh, one billion dollars that could serve for instance to update those lca databases uh, lci exactly life cycle inventories that is in high need or uh, to support institutional strengthening capacity building in developing countries and so on and so forth so mm -hmm. there's a huge need for money in various aspects of course research innovation and so on the european research on uh, raw materials and uh, material sciences um, despite the effort, is really dramatically underfunded. So, uh, I mean, uh, money is there, but uh, it doesn't go uh, where it should go in real scientific and economic needs. It goes in more or less uh, speculative movements, corruption, poor governance, and so on. Okay. Um, to what extent can microelectronics fit into a circular model economy? Uh, Patrice? Um, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a non-ICT expert, so I should say that, but I think uh, the ICT community has already delivered huge benefits uh, to better understand this world, to better measure it, um, and that is extremely important. It helped to progress on many aspects, so we have seen also uh, today how it can further progress on, of course, energy uh, emissions are an issue related to ICT, not only to ICT, but there's scope for hope. And uh, so, uh, of course, uh, uh, the microelectronics industry can help, uh, can do a lot to contribute to circular economy. Of course, a big issue is electronic waste, uh, which is of utmost complexity uh, to recover. Uh, I, I, I forgot to mention, the, on uh, if I take a smartphone, you know the value of all minerals and metals in a smartphone is, in average, it varies according to the model, $1.7 per, uh, 
per smartphone uh, in average. So if you put a 0.1% tax on the raw materials, it won't change uh, the price uh, for the customer in that specific case. But this is a mass product that shows you how a small thing can do uh, wonders without really hurting customers. So we will go directly to the next question because it's uh, related to that. How can we reduce the volume of electronic waste? And is it a good thing to reduce? Should we push recycling, Christian? Uh, yes, of <laughs> course. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, the uh, electronic waste in the world uh, today, uh, only for the, uh, uh, I mean the home uh, application, uh, is around 600 million tons per year. Uh, out of which, uh, most of it, 80% are lost in uh, uh, poor uh, countries like Nigeria, Ghana, uh, India, where there is um, basically no uh, recovery of metals. There are children going in the waste uh, and uh, cutting the uh, electrical cable, burning them to get some copper. But uh, this is one of the big issues. Uh, the second issue in uh, developed countries, uh, we basically recover half of the, uh, of the waste. And uh, there, are, there are a number of metals which are lost, like tantalum uh, or uh, indium and so on, which are not recovered. So there is a huge need of um, First of all, uh, trying to um, improve the situation in Nigeria, Ghana, and so on. That's one of the big need, and uh, it's not easy because it's uh, uh, it's making. I mean, we have doing we done we did some uh, study in uh, India. Uh, there are people living with that uh, poorly. Uh, they are intoxicated, but they are making money and they can eat. Uh, how can we change that? Uh, this requires, uh, uh, first of all, new expertise, new technologies, and uh, a way to reorganize all this uh, informal sector. It's not easy. It must be done with uh, Indian people or with Nigerian people, and uh, this this is not a, an, an easy uh, an easy point. Uh, in um, developed country, we have uh, another issue, which is basically how can we recover more metals. Um, and basically, these are technical metals. Tantalum is necessary, and uh, uh, there is a lack of tantalum basically in the world. And we are depending on uh, the Democratic Republic of uh, Congo, and uh, <laughs> that's not a very comfortable situation. Uh, so yes, we need that, um, and uh, it, it has to be developed. And uh, it uh, requires a lot of R and D. It requires funding, which is. Uh, uh, today uh, not available just because people are not interested by this sort of matter. Uh, so, um, I mean, the uh, uh, people in the finance world are more interested in uh, uh, the new application uh, in uh, ICT or the new, uh, uh, the new project here and there, but not really in recycling. It's uh, considered as a dirty business, it's considered as a sort of a low-tech business, which is not right. And uh, so we need also to instruct people uh, both in uh, the finance world and uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the administrative world. I mean, in the government uh, or in ADEM or in all these uh, um, uh, administration, we see a lack of know-how. They don't understand things. And uh, when you get a young person, uh, Working with this, uh, with this in this entity, uh, they work during three years, and then they are called to another responsibility, and they and you lose uh, the learning curve is just stopped, and a new one is coming, and so on. So there is no capitalization of the know-how which is required and which is necessary. Someone wants comments? M yeah, may maybe just a comment um, regarding the production of waste. The the the. The best solution is to avoid the production of waste before uh, uh, the questions of recycling. And we have a, an experience in the ASD sector is that our uh, uh, electronic, um, let's say, items are lasting more than 30 years, um, between 30 to 50 years. 
Why? It's because they, we, we have implemented uh, repairability, maintenance, and um, this is really um, for the, let's say, the technological innovation that's really important to keep that in mind, uh, to keep technologies which are uh, able to be repaired, which are able to be maintained, because uh, through that, we'll have the op uh, we as downstream users, we could design uh, products which will last very long time, and this is the best way to avoid uh, production of waste and these issues that you, said, you, you just mentioned. I can perhaps add uh, something from uh, uh, from research. We should separate uh, the electronic waste uh, from the electronic product waste. I take an example. If we want the same functionality than a TV, so now we have a, a, a 30 kilos TV where, where electronics in terms of semiconductor silicon is few grams. Yeah. So if we replace this with a contact lens that will give you the same user experience, so you replace 30 kilos by few grams. So we need also to be innovative in the products um, uh, to do that, and also how to separate the various parts, because most of the cost is how to separate the electronics from the, uh, from the metal, from the glass, from the all the parts. Yeah. I would like to rebound on Christian Thomas' explanations about recycling and the issue of regulation. Um, to recycle, you need several things. You need to collect your material, so to create a stream that you will send to some uh, plant to first dismantle your product. Then you will get subcomponents uh, that you will send to whatever recycling process. And here, uh, for instance, neither in France nor at the European level do we have a proper policy on collecting. I have heard many, many presentations in many circumstances about metals recycling, some very brilliant presentations on metallurgical processes and so on, but the weak spot everywhere that pops up is collecting. As long as we do not send our smartphones and so on, we keep them in a drawer and so on, the, um, Nothing happens, eh? So uh, policy making here is very important. And in Europe, we typically have mass-centric policies and not product-centric uh, policies. And we need, uh, if you if you want to it to really happen, you need product-centric policies. What about smartphones? What about TVs? What about this and what about that? Maybe to give a hint to the panel session of this afternoon, maybe an answer could be, could be the service mode. That's you are the product producer, you are the owner of the product, and you are selling service. So then you need to treat and collect your waste, and you t need to maintain the products uh, with a longer life. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, certainly a way to. Uh, uh to, to put the conditions to, to extend or to, um, let's say, uh, make grow the, the, the interest to have longer um, lifetime of products, uh, ability to be repaired, to be maintained. Uh, and that would be, um, uh, let's say, a side effect uh, regarding the, the, the reduction of waste and uh, the improved durability. Okay, so this will be detailed uh, in the panel session of the afternoon. So, uh, before we give one or two questions from the Assembly, um, there is a fear that uh, if we enter this, all these subjects, uh, there is a slowdown of the market growth with regard to microelectronics. What's your feeling on that? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> As we say before, this could be also an opportunity for microelectronics because, as you was said, if, if microelectronics allow to make other processes more efficient, then uh, we should see the global scope, not only the impact of microelectronic per se, but how it's used in the global concept. And, and the idea here, we should find a way to use microelectronics to improve the global um, uh, processes and the global efficiency. So. That might be also, uh, as we said before, an opportunity also for uh, for new uh, market, new use of microelectronics. Yeah, it's a certainly an opportunity of transformation, but we have to see that in a global picture. Um, sure, uh, environmental performance is a, a, um, an opportunity of relocalization, because we spoke about recycling. Recycling is very a local business, so it's a 
it's also on the global picture, it's also transformation of the type of business. Okay. Uh, I was in the, in the tube this morning in Paris, and uh, <coughs> I make a small statistics. 65% uh, of the people were on, a, on their mobile phone. So <laughs> I don't think this will uh, slow down the, uh, the electronic uh, market. Okay, so maybe we can take one or two questions from the public. So, please. Good morning, thank you for your different presentation, very interesting. I have a question about gold recycling. Um, I was wondering why gold recycling is more expensive than uh, classical gold. Uh, for example, in interconnection, we saw that on the market, and we were quite surprised. It's, is uh, it just an ec yes, business uh, it effect? Is not, it is not uh, more expensive. I mean, in the uh, printed circuit board, where gold is mostly concentrated, you get uh, a quantity of gold which is on the poor PCB uh, 10 grams per ton, mm -hmm. and on the rich PCB, 250 grams per ton or something like that. And you can even get some, some PCBs with a thousand a kilo of gold. Yeah. Per, I mean, if you compare that with the, uh, uh, the open pit mining uh, in Africa, uh, the, the grade is less than one gram per ton. So I mean, the concentration is so high that it is profitable to uh, recycle gold from uh, from waste. Yeah. There is no I doubt I about that. I understand that, but f for the customer, it's more expensive. So is, is there a problem <coughs> in the supply chain? I mean, uh, to No, no, it's not more expensive. Gold is sold uh, on the uh, LBME mar uh, market price. So okay. you, there is no, no difference between... Uh, there is a, a strong demand from uh, the jewelry sector to get uh, what they call virgin gold, which is coming from recycling and which has no impact from uh, mining and so on and so on. I mean, uh, of course, at the beginning, it went out from a mine, but, uh, but okay. there is a strong demand for that. Then uh, the jewel, uh, the ring, the gold ring and so on, are sold 30% higher price. But this is, <laughs> this is just a, a market trick. Okay. It's, not, okay. uh, it's not the basis of the, uh, of the price okay. of gold. And the second point was, uh, I was wondering if the problem was not coming from innovation, purely innovation, how to regulate innovation. Uh, because we, we saw that we, we ask, customer ask more and more innovation on the market also, but maybe it is the, the earth of the problem. Mark? Well, <laughs> it's a Javon paradox indeed. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's clear. Uh, we need to, to uh, well, we need also to educate the consumer about all this, uh, all this topic. So, uh, so that's true. But we need also to find a way to uh, have the same experience with devices that have less, uh, less impact on, on, on Earth. So, um, okay. Is there another question? Yes, please. Not only the question is just a statement, or I don't know how to consider it, but uh, it's uh, regarding the materials uh, recycling, and moreover the, the raw materials on the, the uh, these uh, elements which are missing. And in Europe, in nowhere, we cannot uh, uh, extract them from the mining because we, we closed all these mines. And uh, I think uh, uh, someone of you who was speaking about all these uh, uh, mobile phones, but I think in each family there are several computers lying like that on the shelves. And this is, uh, these are the sources of, ma of these raw materials which do not have uh, in Europe. So I think there should be uh, a new politic for um, uh, developing or for uh, funding the projects or innovation projects, how to ex uh, for making extraction of these materials. That uh, I'm I'm partisan of this uh, urban mining because we have them here. We have to develop new new processes, and uh, this is the the new. I think uh, we have, this is the, the cir circular economy for me. So how, I don't know how do you see, but 
we can uh, somehow uh, uh, tell to the European Commission for funding some more, more projects on this. There are different positive, uh, but probably also our national governments, regional governments, okay. to ha somehow to accelerate. So, so the because the European Thank Commission, uh, not only the, uh, there is uh, the, the um, circular economy action plan. In, uh, in 2030. Okay. I need to cut you. Thank okay. you, uh, Valentina. So the question is, uh, what do you think about funding research, about recycling? the what are on the sheds. So we had uh, a, a sentence about that uh, the main problem is the data collection of the waste. But what about the, the funding? Maybe, Christophe, you want to answer again? No? One of you? Um, uh, um, Sorry to ask Yeah, we, 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 we spoke about collection. And in fact, w when we think about innovation, we, we are uh, thinking naturally technological innovation. But innovation is also on the uh, on other side, and maybe on the way we collect things, maybe how to incentivize the the, uh, uh, the, the collection in order that uh, all the computers, the mobile phone, uh, um, uh, do not stay in in, in our uh, uh, apartments and, and houses, and uh, maybe go to the collection uh, streams. So that's also a, a, a way of uh, innovate uh, to accelerate the collection of, of the waste. I have a personal uh, uh, a remark here. Uh, uh, France is uh, is a country, uh, well, the second country with the largest uh, uh, sea surface, and we even increased two years ago by fifteen thousand kilometer, or whatever. Uh, I've heard that a lot of uh, nodules of our earth are also under sea. So indeed, we don't want to have a mining on the soil of France. But I was wondering, well, we have all this area of sea where it's basically on the France territory. Uh, and I didn't see a lot of, uh, well, it's difficult indeed because it's a, 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 a great depth, but uh, that might be also an opportunity to see how we could uh, extract uh, mm. uh, under the sea. You really have so I'm not a specialist, so I yeah. might say crazy things here. Uh, you will, you will that have was nice to say at the end of the... <laughs> You will have a mining ship, and around it, several chips from uh, Greenpeace and all these <laughs> people. <laughs> no, you have the problem of biodiversity also, so this is very important. So we Patrice, need you know that. So, uh, very, very shortly, uh, uh, recycling your uh, PC or your computer or your uh, smartphone, uh, there, there are economic limits uh, so far on what you can do. So recovering copper or uh, uh, copper, gold, it has been uh, mentioned, or uh, cobalt from them is reasonably easy and rewarding. All the rest is worth pennies, and so far, but maybe Christian will give us good news, um, uh, those little pennies for gallium, indium, and so on, no one has convincingly demonstrated so far uh, how he could earn money on recycling that technologically, Everything is feasible. My friends at CEA in Marcoul have convinced me that you can fish out atoms <laughs> one by one from whatever you want. It just has a price. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, please, uh, stop the nonsense about deep sea mining. I have been in various commissions on deep sea <laughs> mining. Uh, deep sea biodiversity. Yeah. Uh, we know absolutely very little, not nothing, but very little, about deep marine ecosystems, how they are connected with the ocean um, a global ecosystem on which we heavily depend for many reasons. So we shouldn't engage into deep sea mining to keep the long story short before we have a clear understanding yeah. how the ocean works and we are yes. not there yet. Yes. Well, so that's, that's a topic <laughs> of research. I totally agree. I totally agree. But some countries are already going there, so it's why yeah, yeah, we no. need to make research first. Yeah, totally agree. So please, please. <laughs> okay, in a nutshell, please now answer to the first question, one after one. From RD to industry, how can we efficiently manage change to rapidly take into account the problems of global warming and resource depletion? What's the very first thing to do, one after the other one? 
Mark, you know? Well, I think that we, we should really have, uh, have this global view and, uh, and uh, not making local uh, life cycle analysis of, uh, of, of things. We should have the global picture, which is very difficult, and see where are the points where we could contribute as, as semiconductor uh, industry to improve this. So I think uh, uh, we really need this global view, which is very difficult, by the way, because a lot of information are not available. People don't really want to collaborate and things like that. So, so for me, is gain, having this global view and seeing where we could really have impact. Christian? Well, I would just make one point. Uh, Today, when you build a new plant, which can be uh, metallurgical or mining or whatever, uh, we should not build a plant without uh, a view that it should be carbon neutral in, in five years' time or two, ten years' time. So that's part of any project which has to be implemented now. And this is not yet in the uh, common sense of the industry. Yeah, well, uh, I, I really think that it's true. Uh, uh, it is true. Um, uh, the inclusion of um, environmental requirements in product regulations that will be uh, the the fast way to uh, fastest way to to really make things changing in reality. Um, I have a long list of recommendations, so, <laughs> <laughs> but I will just highlight to fight against uh, bland obsolescence. I mean, it's absolutely not acceptable that nowadays you still have on the market smartphones which won't be maintained at the, head, uh, at the operating system after two or three years, which is a clever way to make you change it uh, because you are fearing for your security. And so Those kind of marketing tricks are no longer acceptable in the name of sustainability. So that is uh, one thing. And the second thing is really the conception of products, again, if I think about smartphone, about in view of the later recyclability. First, user maintainability. If I want to uh, change uh, the battery of this bloody smartphone here, whatever the brand is, uh, I don't know how to do it. Uh, maybe I can find a shop who will do it eventually, if I'm lucky. Uh, but So uh, products should be conceived to be user maintainable, and secondly, recyclable. That would be two major steps in the right direction. There are more than that, but these are two important ones. And if I can add my part to this reflection, I can say that uh, we need several things. First, we need to understand better the whole thing. And we need to find a way that between scientists and industry, how we can share data to improve a huge database to do LCA, life cycle analysis, so this is an appeal to every industrial in the room. <laughs> and and uh, we need to do LCA both at the very tiny parts, like you have done, like we are doing, and at the macro level to do the understanding and introduce economical uh, uh, parameter in this LCA, how we can introduce economical parameter in life cycle assessment to avoid what you are calling obsolescence, that can maybe only to have something economically viable. So we need to change this, to understand and change. And uh, once and to understand the Jevon parameter, uh, the Jevon paradox. Because we can reduce the energy, we can do everything. And if we are selling more and even more, we just add things to the problems. We, we won't remove it. Take the microphone. Because that's another topic that's dear to my heart. Um, I have a bit of experience with LCA analysis here and there. And most of this work, sorry to say, is not really good because life cycle inventory uh, uh, databases are of generally quite poor quality when it comes to minerals and metals. And therefore, many of the conclusions that can be drawn on them, including some I heard today, are not really convincing. Thank you. So let's have the, sp the speaker. <laughs> so uh, please have a look to the live demo exhibition, the startup and SME village and the forum uh, area where there is uh, sales-oriented speeches. And uh, be, back, be back no later than 2 o'clock 30 to the afternoon session.
Hope you will be there and uh, see you on there. And thanks to our speakers.